Welcome everyone to today's webinar, the Historic Environment, Heritage and Environmental Assessment. Today we are joined by IA's member, Coralie Atchison, a senior consultant with AROP. Coralie has worked in commercial archaeology and heritage consultancy for nine years with experience across large-scale infrastructure projects in energy, transport, flood alleviation and restorative land management. Today's webinar will give an overview of the key aspects of environmental assessment before focusing on ways in which it can be integrated with other topics to contribute to sustainable development. As always, there'll be a chance to ask questions um, at the end of the presentation, so ask these at any time using the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen, and I'll ask these on your behalf later on. Thank you everyone for logging in today, and I'll now hand over to Coralie. Hi everyone. <clears throat> Thank you so much for having me. Um, this is going to be a bit of a whistle stop, but what I, I would like to, to share with you today are um, some definitions, just initially, um, of um, to get us all on the same sort of page in terms of what on earth archaeology and heritage has to do with environmental assessment. Um, but then um, looking a little uh, at how it generally fits into a sort of environmental assessment context, EIA and things like that. But most of the session I'd like to focus on um, how we can um, go further than we typically do in just a kind of standard scope um, scenario. So how um, heritage can contribute to sustainable development, um, how we can work in integrated teams um, to support our ecological and landscape architect colleagues and geological colleagues and all of uh, those kind of aspects. Um, and then um, hopefully have some time for Q&A and discussion at the end, or we will have time, not hopefully. So I wanted to start just by explaining some of the terms because there are three kind of major terms. There's a lot of more sub terms that get used in relationship with heritage. Um, often you'll see um, discussion about archeology. span You'll often see discussion about cultural heritage. That might be the title of an EIA chapter, for example. And um, there's also um, the historic environment, which is my preferred term, but we don't always get to choose the terms that we use. Um, so I thought I'd uh, give some explanations about what these terms mean, but also um, how they're how they're used. So starting with archaeology, um, archaeology is officially, technically, uh, as a topic, as a discipline, is the study of the past from its material remains. So in the context of environmental assessment, the term is typically used to refer to uh, things that get divided into sites and monuments. Now, these are both fairly old terms, but they're used a lot. And so even though they might not be the best terms that we have, they, they're ones that you're probably going to come across or hear people talking about. Um, a site is uh, generally a place where there are archaeological remains. So these are the physical material remains of the past. Sorry, I'm just knocking things over as I talk with my hands. Um, uh, so, um, and they might be below ground in many cases. So this could be um, the sort of things we've got on the screen. So we've got what we might call negative features, which are these kind of pit features that have been excavated. You'll see actually these have been half sectioned. So there's a half circle that's a dark color cut into this lighter color. Um, that's the fill of um, a, an old pit effectively that somebody has dug and that's filled in with another material. So you've got this kind of, negative feature if uh, so the feature is something that is not there that has then been filled back in um, and what we might call a positive feature like a wall or a foundation um, we date these with artifacts with uh, huge wide-ranging scientific techniques um, and we use these to tell the story of the people who used um, the places that we're in today um, but archaeology can be a lot more than that it can be as tiny as pollen preserved in in soil it can be whole um we call it geoarchaeology but like whole kind of clay layers across you know all of like the the thames basin for example and all of these um fit together with just you know the traditional <laughs> stuff the finds um to be what we might call kind of sites um monuments is again this is an old term it's not one that i would use if i had a choice but it tends to be what we're talking about when we're saying archaeology so it's not a historic building so like you know an 18th century house um, but it's it's not underground so we'll call it a monument it's something like this is me with a, a really huge standing stone on the screen so something like a standing stone or, or maybe a castle might be called a monument um, Cultural heritage, I've put up here a um, definition from UNESCO. Um, 
this is a bit of a catch-all term that sometimes gets used to, to refer to um, archaeology, but also um, museums, um, to refer to historic buildings, historic landscapes, generally all of the things that we might think of as kind of the past stuff. Um, so I've, I've highlighted in red some of the things that are included in this term, uh, which are you know artifacts, monuments, buildings, sites, museums, um, and also kind of crucially, when we talk about cultural heritage, we might not just be talking about tangible things. So a standing stone is heritage, or again, these are not the terms that I might use, but that's as it is. Um, but it could also be something like uh, a cultural tradition. And that's particularly the case if we're working outside of the UK with indigenous communities where intangible heritage is often um, as important or more important than physical sites. Um, and finally, the term that I prefer to use in uh, sort of environmental assessment terms is the historic environment, because I think it really helps us figure out how it fits within the environmental assessment context. Um, so uh, the image in the top of the screen is another image from UNESCO, and this is from their most recent guidance to impact assessment for World Heritage Sites. Um, and it's I found it really useful. So they've got this kind of cartoon imaginary landscape, and in it, it's got mountains, it's got volcanoes, it's got cities, fields, different kind of natural habitats, marine habitats and within that there may be heritage sites but those sites are not they don't make sense on their own you can't just pull them out of a place they're they're integrated with this whole landscape that may all have heritage interests and heritage significance but just some parts of it might be more officially designated or protected than others um so on the screen i put um some examples of um some places where you might find a historic environment or aspects of the historic environment. Um, so a lot of the time you might be working in a, a an old town. This is Hereford. You've got um, you've got some 20th century um, interwar housing. Uh, we've got a cathedral in the distance, and under the ground we've got which you can't see in the photo, <laughs> we've got um, the remains of a medieval priory, and all of those things are kind of stacked together, and that is a sort of context in which we can examine all of these different things together and think about what that might mean for development or, or um, conservation. Um, the water feature <laughs> in the middle um, is a lake or a pond, um, but actually it's, um, it's a manufactured uh, site. It's not a natural feature, although it appears to be a natural feature. This was created to dam and um, collect water to feed uh, 19th century ironworks. So when we look at something like this, we might think we're looking at a quite a natural landscape and certainly a place that has ecological interest and significance, um, as well as social interest and all sorts of other things. But it also has heritage interest and heritage significance as part of the story of ironworking um, at this location. We've got somewhere we might obviously think of as a kind of historic environment place. We've got, you know, Avebury, which has got standing stones. But even there, what we've actually got is this Neolithic monument, so middle, um, sorry, New Stone Age, um, but it's also a field that has been farmed in, into, into the present day. There are sheep farming there. Um, there is a village in the literal centre of this stone circle, which um, has sort of hundreds of years of much more recent um, occupation than the prehistoric activity there. So all of these things kind of layer. And I also threw in my, my favourite service station on the M6, just to kind of indicate that, you know, heritage is not just the really old stuff, it can be, um, it can be quite modern structures as well. And something like a, a motorway could be considered a historic landscape, it's certainly a component of a historic landscape, it's just quite a modern piece of that landscape. So that was just to kind of rattle through. Now I've put in this slide, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time here because I suspect m many of the people on the call may know this element of it. Um, but I wanted to kind of ground um, the discussion of what we can do that's maybe more than standard with just commenting on what we do as standard. So if, uh, if you're working in environmental impact assessment or planning or um, permitted development, whatever kind of contacts that we're, we're kind of doing, heritage within an environmental assessment context, you'll quite often see figures like this. If this is from um, the A66 DCO, uh, so this is all public, um, public domain uh, now um, as it's going through examination. And what we've got is a map that uses um, 
the blue and green shading shows areas that are physically theoretically visible, the sort of ZVI that we've um, drawn from um, our LVIA colleagues. And then we've got heritage assets. So in this case, these are designated assets. So ones that are protected by national legislation, listed buildings, scheduled monuments, um, and they're kind of located onto this map in relationship to uh, proposed development, the order limits. And, um, and we use that information to kind of quite, in quite quantify viable way say these are the heritage assets which will be impacted and these are the ways that they'll be impacted and that's got to be as rigorous as possible and replicable as possible so that we can defend it in a kind of examination context but I think we can do a lot more so um I'm sure most of us with have been sort of interested in engagement with the IS, care uh, passionately about sustainable development. And um, heritage is, is a part of that. Um, there's an obvious element of that with um, sustainable cities and communities where um, the heritage and kind of historic values of a place are part of um, goal 11, if you're a sort of bit of a nerd on sort of global goals. Um, but actually um, one aspect in which um, maybe that people haven't thought of i don't know because i don't know who's on the call <laughs> um but um is the fact that uh world heritage sites so these are internationally identified um places both natural cultural and mixed um which are considered to be of outstanding universal value to all humanity um, these sites uh, are um designated through a UNESCO convention and because they're part of this kind of UN project um, they uh, the policy from UNESCO is that they should not only um, be protected as part of sustainable development but that they themselves should contribute to sustainable development so we will have heritage professionals um, colleagues of mine people who um, you know people with my skill set who are working in world heritage site contexts and who are seeking to bring ecological um, improvements to um, you know help with the climate to um, deal with climate resilience to to engage in educational um, and social development and economic development and these are all supposed to be kind of workshopped through world heritage sites so that's a really interesting opportunity i think for us to not only potentially engage with what's happening in world heritage sites but also to learn from what is being done there um, there are lots of really interesting studies that have been done and i'll touch on a couple of them in a minute um, that that we can kind of learn from and maybe apply in much wider non-world heritage contexts. Um, so on the screen, I've just shared a, a few pictures from um, world heritage sites within the UK. At uh, the top one, we've got a uh, beach, which is part of the Jurassic Coast world heritage site. So this is a maybe something that we wouldn't think of as heritage. It's not within that archaeological historic landscape definition set that I used earlier. Because this is a natural world heritage site. So this is. Um, considered to be a place which is uh, of universal value to all people on the planet to do with its geological story. And that's both its geological story in terms of the, mm, the, the actual rocks and the fossils and the sequence of um, uh, different, different kind of periods that are, uh, uh, you can observe all along that coast, but also in terms of the history of how people have, in, have learned about geology in that, in that place and its history and um, sort of scientific history if this is also a place that is eroding it's a coastal location um, and so there's been a lot of really interesting discussions about how they um, they engage with that how they protect or maybe or and actually in the context of the Jurassic Coast um, where the natural erosion processes are considered to be a part of its ongoing management and part of its ongoing story um, so you know really interesting stuff to think about there but somewhere like Blenheim, you know, this is maybe the kind of thing people think of when they think of as heritage. It's this ridiculously wealthy, um, old estate building and um, capability brown landscape, all these kind of things. It is also a place that is investing a huge amount of time, energy and money into ecological um, sustainability. They are the custodians of a large area of ancient oak woodland. They are planting a lot of new trees as part of that, as well as trying to sustain the older um, forest. They um, are developing whole new kind of um, 
pricing schedules to encourage people to travel um, using public transport. They're doing a very wide range of things in a context that you might think of as very traditional kind of old school heritage, um, kind of big old country house, but actually they're doing a lot of work uh, in terms of biodiversity and um, yeah, and so climate resilience, which which is really interesting. Uh, the, the bottom two of Edinburgh, so we might be looking at a whole city context that was just in there to kind of show you that some of these world heritage sites are huge um, and kind of huge cultural landscapes. And then I've got Kew. Um, and what's really interesting about Kew is that Kew is a world heritage site. It is um, enormously important historically in terms of the science that has been done there. But that is not just a historic thing. That's obviously something that's continuing today. It's very important in terms of understanding diseases and also, you know, all kinds of plant um, information. Um, and research is going on there. And that's being managed in the context of cultural landscape, where, which is being managed through its heritage values. So lots of things to kind of think on there. There are some very easy wins. I, I, this is, I probably should have put this one before um, <laughs> the, the uh, World Heritage Sites, um, but just to kind of take it from, from one end to, to the other, there are ways in which we just on a very simple site basis can, you know, reduce our carbon emissions, um, looking at um, something like a ground investigation study, which is done on virtually all kind of new developments. If we also need to do an archaeological study that involves breaking the ground to have a look at the below ground deposits, you can do them at the same time. So we quite often will basically piggyback a kind of archaeological evaluation or a watching brief onto a ground investigation study. There's a, a, a relatively small additional cost to our clients, but there's a lot of savings in terms of efficient efficiencies um, and, you know, just generally not having to break the ground twice, which is good for the community, it's good for our emissions in terms of going to site and all, and, and, and all of that, and machinery and plant. It could be as simple as uh, having a combined site visit, which is the other <laughs> picture, um, where the heritage team might go on a site visit along with the engineers or the ecologists, all sorts. I'm just throwing a lot of ideas here. I'm expecting to hopefully um, have a bit more discussion with you at the end. One of the main ways in which I found real opportunities to work across um, the sort of environmental disciplines with my colleagues is um, in terms of sharing knowledge. So I will draw on knowledge and research that have been done by my colleagues who are doing, uh, say, the ground investigation, um, who may be doing um, landscape uh, research, all these kind of things. But we've also found lots of ways in which um, the heritage team are able to provide uh, evidence to other colleagues working within sort of the sustainability disciplines. Um, I've put some examples on the screen, which I'll briefly talk through. A lot of these images are sort of historic maps and, and even paintings. And one of the things that they allow us to do is um, understand how the environment has been used or has been in the past. So we can help our ecology colleagues to identify ancient woodlands and um, by supporting that identification through you know kind of finding out whether a woodland is on a map in the sort of 17th century uh, or not um but also you know has has this river course been realigned what was its original course um does what does that mean in terms of how uh, people have engaged with the natural environment over time and what does that mean in terms of what we can now do now um, the painting is um, an image of um, a country estate in the 18th century um, a lot of that woodland no longer survives so if we were looking at planting new trees as part of bi um, biodiversity net gain for example we could look at how we can reconstruct kind of historic planting um, which then allows us to preserve the uh, preserve and in this case kind of repair and restore some of the heritage values of that place, whilst also, um, you know, getting getting more trees, which might be one of the objectives that that we're looking at. Um, using old maps, um, we've been able to do things like identify potential bat roosts, uh, so old railway tunnels that have been blocked up and are not 
uh, apparent at ground level are, are almost certainly on old maps um, and are often used as roosts. So that's the kind of thing that we can we can work with. Um, and actually, one thing which I'm quite excited about as, a, as an idea, we, we've toyed with it a few times, we haven't managed to do it yet, um, but is using um, historic uh, sort of archaeological data. This is this kind of pollen diagram. Um, when we're thinking about trying to rewild, renaturalize, restore um, historic landscapes. So if you're working in a Fenland landscape or um, somewhere, you know, we can use our archaeological studies, which include looking at um, what's called palynology, you know, the study of like old pollen and things that are preserved in different kind of uh, archaeological deposits to know what the environment was like at different periods in the past. And then that might be useful in terms of how we what we seek to put back potentially. Um, obviously, the fact that it was like that in the past does not mean that it has to be like that in the future. But it's part of that conversation and data gathering that we can we can share um, across across the disciplines. Um, yeah, and so sort of bringing it into land, I also wanted to um, look at some of the challenges. So um, obviously I've talked about the benefits, um, but quite frequently um, you, uh, people working within um, sustainability uh, projects may find heritage to be a constraint. I, I prefer challenge to constraint because I don't think anything is insurmountable. Um, but, you know, I, I work on a lot of um, flooding related projects and sort of uh, biodiversity and sustainability related projects that are being done alongside flood alleviation. Um, in a lot of those projects, we're looking at doing things like removing historic barriers in, in rivers, uh, such as this weir, um, in order to uh, both uh, prevent flooding, but also enable fish passage. Um, there's very good reasons to do that. But um, the challenge here is that the story of the river is that this is actually a really important engineering feature. The, the bridge above it is a scheduled ancient monument. It is um, a, an aqueduct that was part of the, a canal system, um, which is of, of real national significance as part of the industrial story of this region. The weir is part of that. It was part of how it was fed and how the water was managed. So if we were to just simply remove the weir, which would probably do wonders for the river, we would be um, we'd be removing that nationally significant heritage story. So there's a real tension there, but that doesn't mean that it's obviously not possible. So we're looking at fish passage in that context. Um, another one is, of course, you know, just physical structures and physical change in the landscape. So um, you know, working on um, one of the things that comes up a lot is that uh, we might, as a, uh, you know, with our clients and as in terms of, um, you know, restorative land management, we might want to restore a landscape to uh, a natural state. Now, the problem is most landscapes in Britain are so far from what we might consider to be natural. They've been changed and modified over huge, huge periods of time. And so there's this huge question of which period are we trying to restore it to and understanding where there might be significance in that landscape that we would be harming. So if it's a designed landscape, that's a really obvious one, because that means somebody in the past came along with a notebook and said, well, we're going to move the river and put this pond here and make this view. But a lot of the time, that value is actually just this kind of um, layers and layers of past land use. So you might get something like ridge and furrow, which is the kind of traces of medieval plowing. You um, might get drainage from the 18th century or 19th century that's to do with the agricultural revolution. And all of those elements are part of that story and um, can make it a challenge to simply go in and say, right, we're going to change all of this. And yeah, the last one, I've just put in a picture of a, an existing flood, flood defence in Hereford again. Um, and that had to be designed, obviously, very carefully because uh, we're looking at views of, of the medieval cathedral. And so anything where we want to build a hard structure in an environment um, that has a lot of value for its heritage interest, um, we've got to kind of work with those, those challenges. Right, I realise I have really rattled, so I must have really spoken very quickly, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but I've now just got time for questions and discussion, and I'd love to unpack any of those elements that we've, um, uh, that I've gone into um, 
because I know I've sort of raced through and I wasn't sure who would be on the call and what kind of things people might be particularly interested in. Fantastic. Thank you, Coralie. Um, it's really interesting, especially the last slide there, just to hear the, the challenges um, between the kind of practicalities of them, the changes that removing some of these or maybe not removing, changing some of these um, heritage sites against the benefits to the environment. Um, we do have a couple of questions, um, but like you've said, if there's any more questions, just pop them in the um, Q&A. Um, so the first one is, and it's just a question that someone's asking in terms of they're looking to undertake studies. Um, so it's just, is environmental archaeology the same as historic environment? Yeah, OK, let me go back to one of my earlier slides. Um, so my understanding of environmental archaeology as a specific thing is the um, this kind of looking at things like pollen, it's looking at um, ostracods and various things as, as a subdiscipline of archaeology, but that might not be what the person asking um, meant. So could I just check which what they meant in terms of environmental archaeology and I'll and yeah. but yet the answer it will be yes it is part of the historic environment okay. <laughs> but I can answer that probably a little bit better. Perfect I'll just give them a chance to respond to that. Um, so another question that we've got here is the comment on the analysis of pollen is interesting could this be used in the context of historical agricultural land holdings to understand what agricultural practices were present prior to written record? Yeah and that's definitely. from Greg Davies at the English Heritage Trust. Yeah, so um, I think that's a really big opportunity. Uh, we, um, I'm working on a few Fenland projects, so that's part of where where we've been kind of exploring this idea. Um, so there's a few limitations on that where um, archaeology, what we might call the archaeological record, is not uh, is not complete. So we don't have everything that has ever been there, both natural and kind of cultural materials. So um, in order to have uh, surviving evidence of past agriculture um, in terms of pollen to tell us exactly what species and uh, species mix we've got, we would need to have um, organic preservation. So that tends to be uh, where you've got watery contexts, wet contexts, and they're often vulnerable to things like, you know, sort of 19th century, 18th century land drainage. So um, if our GI on a site, our ground investigations indicates that we've got things like peat uh, or sort of wet high groundwater levels, then it would be really useful if that was something that uh, other topics and sort of disciplines were interested in then we could look in, uh, at commissioning further study on those um, sort of, um, would there be lab-based studies to see if we've got the right evidence to sort of further analyze that. And then we can tell you, effectively we'd get a report and it would tell you what, uh, what pollen or what plants and sort of land practices like burning and clearance, things like weeds can tell us about, uh, weed pollens can tell us what kind of, uh, can tell us about, um, like cattle grazing and things so there's a there's a really wide range of information that we can get from that data however if we don't have the possibility for that kind of uh, environmental archaeology we can often tell a lot about past environment from other sources that are not like historic documents so um we might have evidence of past uh, say like plowing we might have animal bone which will tell you about pasture um you can have burnt remains is another way where you get charred plant evidence maybe in sort of uh, burnt pottery so there there are a wide range of things and if um if you've got archaeologists on your on your projects um you wouldn't necessarily have to like commission any of this uh, like mm -hmm. tend to be quite friendly just kind of wander over and say by the way do you have any idea what the landscape on this site was like 500 years ago or a thousand years ago because we probably know when we just didn't know that anyone else was interested <laughs> so um it's that kind of i think there's a huge opportunity for just sharing knowledge because i i learned so much from my colleagues in other disciplines and um, and we've had lots of really interesting discussions where we found out that we're all kind of interested in each other's evidence um, that we wouldn't know if we weren't just chatting <laughs> you're just having a conversation about it so that's it from us today. Thank you for logging in. I hope you find it beneficial and informative.